you know, it's almost game over. We lose a lot. So I think we really got to become more conscious in, in our thinking, more awake in our choices of food uh, between medicine and poison. I think we all have to become smarter and more like grandma and grandpa, all of us. A lot of people don't know this, but food security and food sovereignty are two very different things. And you've heard me talk about both of them on this channel. Food security is having access to food, access to, to food that could sustain you. But food sovereignty is having control over your choices of what you put into your food. Now, a lot of us have food sovereignty, but we don't utilize it. A lot of us live in a world where we just blindly go to the grocery store and buy things and throw it into our body. But food sovereignty to me is actually very important because it's, it's kind of having agency and control over what you consume. The more that we don't pay attention to the things we're eating, the, the more control others have over us, the, the more they can slip into our diets and, and impact our health, impact our well-being, impact our psychology. I recently had a conversation with Roger Frawa uh, from the Flower Hill Institute about food security and food sovereignty, the differences between the two, how they go together, and kind of where we are in society today. And I wanted to play some of that conversation for you today because he and I have some very interesting conversations. We may not agree on everything in the world, but this is something that we both feel very passionate about. And um, his work and, and my work are very much aligned when it comes to trying to educate and, and help people understand the importance of paying attention to what it is that they're eating and making sure that we don't have, we don't lose the right that we have to go out and pick and choose what we put into our bodies. It is certainly not a right that you wanna give up voluntarily by mistake. And I think that a lot of Americans are doing that. I think a lot of Americans just simply don't pay attention to it. And I think that Roger Frawa comes from a community of, of people and cultures where a lot of that right was taken away from them. So they know what it's like to lose it. When we were in Maine and I was thinking about our conversation I had on the way up about food sovereignty versus food security, um, and we went and interviewed the Penobscot chef. We we didn't expect to have that as part of the the trip. It was kind of an extra treat. And he and I kind of got into several conversations around food security. But the dish that he made for us um, was kind of a play on bison tacos with an, an, an indigenous twist. The the twist is that besides the bison meat was the the breading that he made it out of was kind of a flat cornbread, um, fried cornbread style. Um, I wouldn't call it a pita. It was it was very it was very different the way he made it. But he described it to me as when um, when they when their reservation was set up, they took the islands of the Penobscot, and that's pretty much what they had to work with which limited a lot of their ability, you know, they're salmon people, but it limited a lot of their ability to hunt and forage and some of the other things that they were able to do throughout the state before they were restricted to that space. And so then they had to rely on things like corn flour and government commodities to feed them. And I kind of see a similarity, you know, a lot of People don't even realize it today, but they they rely on government commodities to feed them um, instead of being able to. And some people do have the ability to go out. They just they don't. They're mentally stuck in that space. Um, but, you know, he wanted to put that on the menu to preserve the history and culture of his people um, because that has developed that particular food has developed over time as part of their culture, because that's what they had to rely on for uh, subsistence. When we talk about, there were a couple of things there, you know, cultural preservation with uh, the, the indigenous peoples, you know, one of the things he was concerned with was the removal of a lot of their imagery from things. He felt like in his perspective, they were kind of being erased um, but then the other side of this is when we talk about food sovereignty versus food security, food security is having access to food. It's sometimes it, it's not healthy food. That's what we call food desert. Food sovereignty is having control over the food that you're, you're putting into your body in, in my perspective. And I kind of feel like, you know, in his scenario, 
or in in that particular reservation scenario, they didn't really have food sovereignty uh, um, on the reservation because they they didn't have access to all of the things that they needed to sustain themselves. They had to rely on this external source. Um, and I've heard that from other indigenous communities from talking with uh, Wheezy Pan over at Rosebud and uh, that when you look at the Wind River, River Reservation with their loss of water rights and how that's in, impacted their food sovereignty, their ability to um, to work with their natural resources to feed themselves. But then even today in, you know, with everybody, it seems like you, you look at the, the Dutch farmers, they feel that they're losing some of that sovereignty by not by having legislation come in and say you can't you know we need to cut back on 30 percent of our uh, meat growers or you know even here in the U.S. there there are many communities that have restrictions on what people can grow and raise and there are um, so I think that food sovereignty is almost as big a question as uh, food security. Yeah I think food security and food sovereignty um, you can almost talk about that uh, interchangeably, even though they mean, and really the outcomes are two separate things, but combined, you know, um, very important. I don't think that the American Indian has a monopoly on, on culture by any stretch. I think we're all tribal. We all have cultures uh, that are very beautiful. I think the yeah. American Indian makes up 90% of America's diversity in the, sa- in, the, in the sense of language, food, song, dance, ceremony, customs, traditions, and governance. Um, I think that there's a great diversity there because I travel a lot for my work all across Indian country and I can, you know, make a reservation on an airline, swipe my card and jump in the Uber and go to the city center, walk through Walmart, Walgreens and, you know, kind of figure out and navigate my way around. But when I'm in Indian country, it's very, very diverse. Um, and, um, I think that I've learned as a guest and a traveler in Indian country um, that sometimes, you know, I just fall in love with ourselves and thinking, Oh, Indian country is so beautiful, so diverse. But when you go to rural America, I think that same beauty and that same diversity is there. So I think that when we talk about food sovereignty as American Indian, we think about sovereignty as, you know, from a governance standpoint, because we are a unique and distinct sovereign nations. We're 577, states within states, uh, essentially, and we're separate units of government. And there's a federal Indian relationship based on American history and trust responsibility and whatnot. Um, But I think about the rural American that we share so much in common with, and food sovereignty is equally as important and beneficial to us as all Americans, um, and not just the American Indian. I think, you know, there's a lot we have in common and we have more in common than we have in difference, I think. And food sovereignty is so important. You know, we talk about the five food groups and, and uh, nutrition literacy and, and those kinds of things that are needed, diabetes, obesity, and those kinds of things that have killed more of my people, and more of my family than COVID ever has. And there's no checkpoint, there's no dollar, there's no federal response, there's no funding, um, there's no job act you know, for diabetes, obesity, and those kinds of things, and hypertension that have killed my people based on nutrition, um, that have killed my people more than COVID. So I just think that we all have to be able to respond in a COVID-like way um, to the two food groups, not five food groups, not the food pyramid, the two groups. There's only two food groups. Food is medicine or food is poison. That's it. It's very simple. And consciously, I take some of the other, I take food poison sometimes by choice. You know, I'll have a soft drink every now and then, not very often, but I will. You know, I'll put uh, sugar in things. Um, and that is poison. And I'm willingly, knowingly doing that. And there's only two food groups. You know, I'm looking here at this landscape, and this landscape is just full of beautiful food and medicinal plants. And sometimes we forget that the two food groups are, are pretty simple. And that's, that's food sovereignty, I think, and that's food security is sometimes it's us, you know, if you want to call ourselves at the top of that food chain that we've been taught in Western etiology that, you know, the wing, the fin, the four leg, the pollinators, the microbes, you know, 
they are there to serve us. And that, that's, that is so not true. You know, we're here to serve them and protect them. I mean, who speaks for the wing? Who speaks for the fin? Who speaks for the four-legged and the pollinators and the birds? You know, the microbes in the ground to make healthy soil. You know, I think us humanity, we all have to become more indigenous and more sovereign and start thinking about our connection to those because when we lose those pollinators, you know, it's almost game over. We lose a lot. So I think we really got to become more conscious in, in our thinking, more awake in our choices of food uh, between medicine and poison. Um, and not that it has to be legislated, um, you know, for us. I think we all have to become smarter and more like grandma and grandpa, all of us. The intention I was trying to make is that, you know, we're all so concerned about the food pyramid and the five different food groups and those kinds of things. And, you know, I've learned as a, as a kid in school, um, you know, that, that that's so important to think about uh, food diversity and those kinds of things. But as an adult and the more I age and the more I learn uh, from my elders and the more sinks in from my uh, 99 year old grandmother, there really is only two food groups. The two food groups are food is poison or food is medicine. And that's it. And when you think about the foods that are on our landscape here, you know, um, there's lots of med medicinal foods, you know, food is medicine. There's lots of medicinal foods that are so good for us, to, for, our, for our DNA, for our bodies, for our minds, for our lungs, you know, for all of our organs, you know, food is medicine. And yet the other food group is food is poison. And, and I think when we willingly ingest poison into our food system and into our bodies, you know, we make conscious choices about picking up some of those sugars and sodas and, uh, synthetic foods that maybe are not so healthy, you know, with all kinds of additives and colors and chemicals to that, you know, I think it's a choice. And I think there's lots of times that we're just moving so fast through this modern world that we're not even conscious that that's, you know, we're, we're, we're choosing poison instead of medicine. And I think if we choose more medicine than poison, I think we're all going to be healthier and better for it. There's definitely a cultural disconnect between where where our resources are going on a daily basis, you know, because we're we're putting so many resources into the next car we're going to buy and the next house we're going to live in. Um, there was a time when our resources were put towards living. You know, you look at at an animal, and all day long that animal has one focus, and that is to eat and live. And you know, and then you look at us; we're the only species on the earth where our focus is not in. Not on how we're going to live the next day, but how we're going to, you know, enjoy it. You know, I think just continuing to have conversation, I think, between amongst each other as diverse humans, you know, my understanding and, you know, what I've gotten to um, truly understand and now really believe in is that we're all spiritual beings and we share this human existence and we're going to go back to being spiritual beings. And I think when we think about ourselves and being on this planet for this long, and sharing this human existence between and amongst each other. Charlie, you and I are sharing a human existence right now by having this conversation. I don't believe okay. in accidents. I don't believe in coincidences. You and I are supposed to be here talking about this subject. And when, we, as we have this very honest and candid discussion about ourselves as humanity and ourselves in relationship to the winged fin, four-legged microbes, pollinators, and we, we have that discussion about kind of where we are in, in this place and in this time, I think that there are opportunities for us to share communication and conversation. I think if we slowed down a little bit and Roger and Charlie had more opportunity to discuss more things and we're able to capture these discussions and we put them out there in the ether of, you know, kind of social media or somewhere where somebody will come along that person in New York, Chicago, Detroit, Florida, Miami, Los Angeles will pick up their phone and be able to check your um, YouTube channel and learn something about themselves through this discussion. I think that's the I think that's the opportunity we all have. And I think if Roger and Charlie can connect at a true human level and be very sincere and honest in our discussion, then maybe two other people will do that. And I think that that's the opportunity for us to share as humanity, as spiritual beings sharing this human existence. 
I think we all have that opportunity daily. We all have that opportunity to have a, commu- a conversation, a communication with other humans. And we all let it, all let our guard down and be more trusting and, and more honest in our approach to each other and more sincere to be able to connect with each other. And we're going to learn something through that learning. You know, you tell me about your grandfather, I'll tell you about mine. You tell yeah. me about your recipe and I'll tell you about mine. You tell me about how you gather food and I'll tell you about how I do that. And we're going to learn from each other. And I think that's the opportunity we have in front of us. You know, we focus a lot on regenerative agriculture or you know, all these fancy terms that have been thrown out there over the years. Um, and, uh, you know, th- they're used until they start getting misused and then they move on to another term. But um, what I like about the concept of kind of a holistic approach to food systems, to food supply, is that when you look at us as spiritual beings, like you just said, um, and you look at the concept that that is reflecting in spirit of, you know, biodiversity working together in this endless cycle of life that's constantly rejuvenating itself. Um, It just feels like we've been disconnected from that, which I think disconnects us from spirituality and reconnecting with that and kind of putting the focus back on how that, that system works. I mean, that is kind of a reflection of, you know, spirit. It's, it's showing kind of an everlasting circle of, of life and existence. And you know, Charlie, you said something really important it, it, in the two words you use were disconnecting from this and reconnecting with that. And I think that humanity and the direction that we're headed in and the trends that we're headed in and the kind of corporations and um, uh, technologies that are out there, I'm talking to you from an iPhone, you know, um, in the middle of a, a high desert plateau in, in uh, northwestern New Mexico, and you're where in North Carolina, and we're, we're, we're sharing technology. I think that uh, if we could disconnect, not your YouTube channel and not your work, but if we could disconnect um, a little bit more and reconnect to the ground and to the um, to the um, to the elements, you know, of, of fire, wind, water, you know, soil, you know, those kinds of things and become more parts of that, even just a little bit more. I think if each one of us will do that, we'll all be more gentle. And that's another reason to buy local. I mean, it, by localizing yeah. and deindustrializing something as simple as a food system, that should be kind of, I mean, at the basis of, of your thought as a being on this earth, you know, you, you, you're able to help facilitate that a little better by bringing it back down and scale a little bit. <laughs> and people are, I think, a little concerned about the economics of, can I afford to buy local? Yeah. And we pay $1,000 or $1,200 for the new iPhone. And we wait in line for that. And we pay $7 for the Starbucks coffee. I mean, it doesn't make sense, right? I mean, it's what we're putting into our body. And we're, we're questioning, can we afford to do that? And should we do that? You know, it, it, it almost doesn't make sense. And I think that we've really got to start and think more critically and analytically about, you know, what am I doing? You know, I can only, Roger can, I'm not going to say control Roger, but I think because I can't control the environment, and things in the politics and in the, in the world around me, but I can, I can, you know, maybe have more influence over my own choices, poison or medicine, buying local, uh, or buying that Starbucks cup of coffee, you know, those, those kinds of things. I mean, yeah, I think food sovereignty, as Wizzy Pan said it when we were interviewing him for our Bison documentary, it's having agency over your own body, like knowing what you're putting in there, knowing what you're consuming. Right. Um, and a lot of people don't realize that when they, when they go to the store and you read the ingredients on something, you don't know half of what that is that you're actually right. consuming and putting into your body, but then you do it anyway, because the label says it's safe. Um, but how much of it is safe? How much of that should you be consuming? And especially when there are words that you can't even identify with, whereas, you know, we have the ability to make the choice to eat something that we, we know where it came from and, and we know what it's supplying our body without, you know, having a whole bunch of, added on ingredients to preserve it. <laughs> and I think one of the most supreme acts of cultural preservation, uh, food sovereignty, food security, 
um, nutrition literacy, healthy lifestyles, is grow your own food. I mean, even in a box in New York or Detroit or Miami or Los Angeles, you can grow food. I mean, you know, you, you it's possible, right? So I think maybe not of all not all of us can be ranchers and have our own herd of cattle and process our own meat, but I think there are things that we can all do that could inch us toward you know, doing those kinds of things. And that's like that's not a two for one; it's a like seven for one. You know, when you can grow your own food and know your neighbor and where that where your meat comes from and it's local and you know you go to the farmer's market and you buy the vegetables from your local farmer and you pay sixty dollars for that pair of socks you know there are things that we can do and i think if we just become more active participants in our own existence while we're here this our human existence while we're here you know we just become more awake uh while we're here the world's going to be a better place